Live from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering DataWorks Summit 2018. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Welcome back everyone to day two of theCUBE's live coverage of DataWorks here in San Jose, California. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, James Kobielis. We have two guests on this panel today. We have Tim Vincent, he is the VP of Cognitive Systems Software at IBM, and Steve Roberts, who's the offering manager for big data on IBM Power Systems. Thanks so much for, for coming on theCUBE. Oh, thank you. Thanks for, for having us. So we're now in this new era, this cognitive systems era. Can you let, let set the scene for our viewers and tell, tell our viewers a little bit about what you do and, and why it's so important? Okay, I'll, I'll give a bit of a background first because James knows me from my previous <laughs> role. As, yeah. You know, and I've spent a lot of time in the data and analytics space. I was the CTO for Bob running the analytics group up till about a year and a half ago. And we, we spent a lot of time looking at what we needed to do from a data perspective and AI's perspective. And Bob, when he moved over to the cognitive systems, well, Bob Picciano, who's, who's my current boss, mm -hmm. he, Bob um, asked me to move over and really start helping build, help to build out more of a software and more of an AI focus and a workload focus on how we're thinking of the power brand. So we spent a lot of time on that. So when you talk about cognitive systems or AI, what we're really trying to do is think about how you actually couple a combination of software, so co-optimize the software space and the hardware space, specific for what's needed for AI systems, because the actual processing, the data processing, the algorithmic processing for AI is very, very different than what you would have for a traditional, traditional data workload. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about how you actually co-optimize those systems so you can actually build a system that's really optimized for the demands of AI. And is this, is this driven by customers? Is this driven by just a, a, a a trend that IBM is seeing? I mean, how are you? It, it's a combination of both. So a lot of this is that, you know, there was a lot of thought put into this before I joined the team, so there was a lot of really good thinking from the power brand, but it was really uh, foresight and things like the Moore's Law coming to an end of a life cycle, right? And, and the ramifications to that, and at the same time as you start getting into things like neural nets and the floating point operations that you need to drive a neural net, there was clear that we were hitting the boundaries, and, and then there's new technologies such as what NVIDIA produces with their GPUs that are clearly advantageous. So, uh, there, was, there was a lot of trends that were coming together that the technical team saw, and at the same time we were seeing customers struggling with specific things. You know, how do I actually build a model if the training time is going to be weeks and months, or you know, let alone hours? And one of the, one of the scenarios I, I like to think about, I'm probably showing my age a bit, but I went to a school called University of Waterloo, and when I went to school um, in, in my early years, they had a batch-based system for comp compilation and a systems run. You sit in the lab at night and you submit a compile job and the compile job would say, okay, it's going to take three hours to compile the application. And you think <laughs> of the productivity hit that has to you. And that, now you start thinking about, okay, you've got this new skill in data scientists which is really, really hard to find. They're very, very valuable. And you're giving them systems that take hours and weeks to do what they need to do. And you know, so they're trying to derive these models and get a high degree of accuracy and, um, in their predictions, and they just can't do it. So there was, there was you know, foresight on the technology side, and there was clear demand on the, uh, the customer side as well. Well, before the cameras were rolling, you were talking about the how data, the term data scientists and app developers is used interchangeably, and that's just wrong. And actually, let's hear, because IBM's whole position, and I agree with it, I think it's the right framework, data science as a team sport, but application development as an even larger mm. team sport in which data scientists, data engineers play a role. So, uh, we, uh, yeah, we want to hear your ideas on the broader application development ecosystem and where data scientists and data engineers and so forth fall into that broader spectrum and then how IBM is supporting that entire new paradigm of application development with your solution portfolio, including you know, power, uh, AI on power. So. So I think you use the word collaboration and team sport. And data science is a collaborative team sport, but you're 100% correct. There's also, a, and I think it's missing to a great degree today, and it's, it's, probably, into, it's probably limiting the, the uh, actual value of AI in, in, the, in the industry. And that's how do the data scientists and the application developers inter, interlap, inter, interact with each other. Because if you think about it, uh, one of the models I like to think about is a consumer pr producer model. Who consumes things and who produces things? <laughs> and, and basically the data scientists are producing a specific thing, which is you know, simply machine an AI models, you know, AI models machine learning and deep learning. 
and the application developers are consuming those things and they're producing something else, which is the application logic which is driving your business processes and and this view. So, so they, they got to work together. But there's a lot of confusion about who does what. You see people who talk about data scientists build application logic and you know the, the number of people who are data scientists can do that is you know, it, it exists, but it's not where the value, the value they bring to the equation. And the application developers de de developing AI models, you know, they exist, but it's, it's, it's not the most prevalent form factor. But, but you know what's kind of unbalanced, Tim, in, in the, the industry's discussion of these, these role definitions? Quite often the traditional you know, definition of our scoping of a data scientist is that they know statistical modeling um, plus data management plus coding, right? But you never hear the opposite, that coders somehow need to understand how to build statistical models and so forth. Do you think that the coders of the future, well at least on some level, need to be conversant with the pra best pra or the practices of, of, of building and tuning or training yeah. the machine learning models uh -huh. or, or no? I, I think it'll absolutely happen, and I will take it actually a step further, because again, the data scientist skill is hard for a lot of people to, to find. Yeah. And as such, it's a very valuable skill. And what we're seeing, and we are actually, one of the offerings that we're pulling out is something called AI, Power AI Vision. Yes. And it takes it up at another level above the application developer, which is how do you actually really unlock the capabilities of AI to the business persona, the subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Vision, how do you actually allow somebody to build an, uh, a model without really knowing what a deep learning algorithm is, what kind of neural nets you use, how to do data preparation? So we build a tool set which is you know, effectively a SME tool set which allows you to automatically label, you know, we actually allows you to tag and label images. And then as you're tagging and labeling images, it learns from that and that actually helps automate the labeling of the image. Is this distinct from data science experience on the one hand, which is geared towards the data scientist, and I think Watson Analytics among your tools is geared towards the SME. This is a third tool or, yeah, this is a or third overlap? Tool, but this is a third tool, which is really, again, one of the um, co-optimized capabilities that I talked about. Mm -hmm. is it's a tool that we've built out um, that really is leveraging the combination of what we do in power, yeah. the interconnect which we, we have with the, uh, the GPUs, which is the NVLink interconnect, which gives us uh, you know, basically a 10x improvement in ba bandwidth between the CPU and B, uh, GPU. Hmm. That allows you to actually train your models much more quickly. So we're seeing about a 4x improvement over competitive technologies that are also using GPUs, and if, you know, if we're looking at machine learning algorithms, we've recently um, come out with some technology we call SnapML, which allows you to push uh, machine Snap learning algorithms. Yeah, it allows you to push machine learning algorithms down into the GPUs. And this is, we're seeing about a 40 to 50 per X improvement over traditional processing. So it, it's coupling all these capabilities, but really allowing a business persona to do something specific, which is, allow them to build out AI models to do recognition on either images or videos. Is there a pre-existing library of models in the solution that yeah, they can it, tap it, into? It, 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 it basically, it allows, it has a-, a Are they pre-trained? No, they're not pre-trained models. Okay. That's one of the differences in it. It actually has a set of models that it, allow, it picks for you. And actually, uh, so, oh, this, yes. so okay. this is why it helps the business persona, because it's helping them with the labeling of the data. It's also helping select the best model. It's doing things under the covers to optimize things like hyperparameter tuning. But you know, the, the end user doesn't have to know about all these no. things, right? So you're trying to lift, lift the, you know, and it comes back to your point on application developers, it allows you to lift the, the barrier for people to do these tasks. Even for professional data scientists, there may be a vast library of models that they don't necessarily know what is the best fit for the particular task. Ideally, you should have, the infrastructure should recommend and choose under various circumstances, the models and the algorithms, the libraries, the whatever, for you, for a particular task. Yeah. Right. So one, so. one actual feature of PowerAI Enterprise is that it, it does include a way to do a quick visual inspection of a model's accuracy with a small data sample before you invest in scaling over a cluster or a large data set. So you can get a visual indicator as to the, whether the model is moving towards accuracy or you need to go and test an alternate model. So, so it's like a dashboard of like Gini coefficients and all that stuff. Okay. Exactly, okay. it gives you a snapshot, snapshot view. And the other thing I was going to mention, you guys talked about uh, application development data scientists, and of course a big message here at the conference is you know, data science meets big data. And mm -hmm. the work that Hortonworks is doing, evolving the notion of container support in Yarn, yes. GPU awareness in Yarn, uh, bringing uh, data science experience which can include the Power AI capability that Tim was talking about as a workload 
tightly coupled with Hadoop, uh, and this is where our power servers are really built not for just a um, you know, monolithic building block that always has the same ratio of compute and storage, but fit for purpose servers that can address either GPU optimized workloads, providing the bandwidth enhancements that Tim talked about with the GPU, but also data dense servers that can now support two terabytes of memory, double the overall memory bandwidth on the box, uh, cores, uh, 44 cores that can support up to 176 threads for parallelization of Spark workloads, SQL workloads, distributed data science workloads. So it's really about choosing the combination of servers that can really mix this evolving workload need. Because Hadoop isn't now just MapReduce, it's a multitude of workloads that you need to be able to mix and match and bring uh, various capabilities to the table for compute. And that's where Power 8, now Power 9, has really been built for this kind of combination workloads where you can add acceleration where it makes sense, add big data, smaller smaller cores, smaller memory where it makes sense. Pick so Steve, choose. at this show at DataWorks uh, 2018 here in San Jose, the prime announcement, partnership announcement between IBM and Hortonworks was IHAH, which I believe is IBM Hosted Analytics on Hortonworks. What I want to know is that solution that runs inside, I mean it runs on top of HDP 3.0 and so forth, is there any tie in from an offering management standpoint between that and Power AI so you can build models in the Power AI environment and then deploy them out to, in conjunction with the IHAH, or is there, going forward, I mean, just want to get a sense for whether well, the, the same data science capability, data science experience, whether you choose to run it in the public cloud or run it yeah. in a private cloud model or on-prem, it's, it's the same data science package. Um, you know, Power AI has a set of optimized deep learning libraries that can provide advantage on power, apply when you choose to run those deployments on our power system. Right? So we can provide additional value in terms of these optimized libraries, this, this memory bandwidth improvements. So it really depends upon the customer requirements and whether uh, a power foundation would make sense in some of those deployment models. Um, I mean, for us here with Power 9, we've recently announced a whole series of Linux Power 9 servers, that's our latest family, uh, including, as I mentioned, storage dense servers, the one we're showcasing on the floor here uh, today, along with GPU rich servers. We're releasing fresh reference architectures really to support um, combinations of cluster models that can, as I mentioned, fit for purpose for the workload. Uh, so bring data science and big data together in the right in the right combination, uh, and working towards cloud models as well that can support mixing power in ICP with big data solutions as well. And before we wrap, we're just about to wrap. I I, I think it, in the reference architecture you described, I'm excited by the fact that you've commercialized distributed deep learning for you know the the growing number of instances where you're going to build containerized AI and distribute pieces of it. Uh, across a, a multi-cloud, you need the underlying, as it were, middleware fabric to allow all those pieces to play together into some larger mm -hmm. application. So I've been following DDL, because you, your research uh, lab has been uh, posting information about that uh, you know, for quite a while. So I'm excited that you guys have finally commercialized it. IBM does a really good job of commercializing what comes out of the lab, like with Watson. Great, well, good note to end on. Thanks so much for joining oh, us. Thank you, yes. thank you for the, thank you. We will have more from theCUBE's live coverage of DataWorks coming up just after this.